Hello, everyone. Welcome to this edition of Wide Receiver Wednesday. I'm your host, Herman Moore, former NFL All-Pro Wide Receiver, breaking down wide receiver film from around the NFL. And today, I'm going to do something a little different. We're going to be breaking down some of your boys' film from back in the day. So I know you would like to see that. Um, coming into the NFL, give you a little background, at 6'4", 220 pounds, uh, you know, I was thought of being a physical possession style wide receiver, mainly used in the red zone. Uh, I was not considered to be one that could particularly run the entire route tree, even though I did that in college. But I didn't want to be pigeonholed. I wanted to make sure that I showed them I could run that entire route tree. So today, I'm excited to show you how I developed my game throughout my career. But before I do that, you gotta subscribe to our channel so I can continue to bring you videos like this. You gotta hit that like button. So if you're ready, I'm ready, let's go. Okay, so now coming into the NFL, 1991, I knew there were a handful of wide receivers that I wanted to, to be like, that I wanted to emulate, that had all the tools, but they, it wasn't necessarily one wide receiver that possessed all those. I'll tell you the two that caught my attention right away was none other than Sterling Sharp, wide receiver for the Green Bay Packers, who was at that time, hey, that was my guy, right? I used to watch him with his black gloves on. He used to come out, man, Sterling was all cut up. You know, you've seen his, his brother, you know, Shannon, you know, they, they come from a family. They're, that's a good genetic pool, man, that they come from. But I will tell you this. He was very fluid. He ran excellent routes. He had speed. He was physical. He was tough. I was taller. I was bigger. And I just didn't have that togetherness and that, that sharpness that he had. But, man, Sterling Sharp was a guy. The other guy was none other than the GOAT, Jerry Rice. You know, this was a person who attacked. He ran excellent routes. You heard about his work ethic. He was just he was just a freak of nature. He was just phenomenal. And he was your your prototypical. If you had to say this is the wide receiver I want, I want that guy. But then there were a couple other guys like Michael Irvin, the physical nature, the competitive nature of Michael Irvin. The fact that he was called the playmaker was because he was making plays. You know, Mike, he was a possession style wide receiver, but he could run most of the tree as well. But you didn't see him running the entire tree, even though he could coming out of Miami, but I knew Michael Irvin was just a competitive player. That spirit that he had is something I admired. The final guy was Chris Carter. Now I'm telling you all these guys are Hall, you know, they're Hall of Famer. Sterling Sharp should be a Hall of Famer. Even though his career ended early, I still think he should be a Hall of Famer. But Chris Carter was another guy. The tenacity, just the body control and catching the football, just looking at how he caught the ball with his hands. And then the other thing I loved about Chris Carter was his craft and the way he disguised his routes. He did it on the rhythm of his route. He did it in the ability to run what we call stems on his routes, which would throw the defensive back off, which would make him move one way or another. And I looked and studied all these players. I, didn't be, I wasn't that my first year. In fact, I struggled my first year. My first year in the NFL, I dropped quite a few passes in preseason, which slowed my ability to get on the field during the regular season because I decided as a player who wore glasses and contact lenses that for some smart reason, I decided not to wear my contact lenses during the game, especially during preseason. So as you can imagine, had some, some setbacks, but ultimately broke into the starting lineup before the end of the 1991 season, ultimately having some success in the playoffs, including our win against the Dallas Cowboys, which at this point has been our only playoff win. But from then on, I understood I had to develop tools in my toolbox if I was gonna be successful as a wide receiver. Today, I'm gonna to break down three of my fun plays. And I'm taking it from one game, which is Green Bay Packers in 1995. Playing a home game against them, and this, came, this comes from my personal stash, my personal archive uh, footage that I've kept over the years. And there's three routes that I'm gonna run, because again, I told you before, if you are a tall receiver, I didn't wanna be pigeonholed into just being a fade route receiver. I didn't wanna be thought of as just a possession style receiver over the middle, or someone who could really get physical at the line and run the slant route. 
So in this one, I was running the angle route, which comes off of a motion, which means you have to have good footwork. You got to be able to have good change of direction. And then you have to be able to really understand what the defense is doing to you and is trying to do to you when you're in motion. The second route I'm going to run is called a dig route. It's just simply on the outside. It's a five yard route. You wait for the tight end to clear through the middle. In this one, the tight end didn't clear in the middle. He actually checked up at about five yards and I was bringing traffic into where he was, but he's supposed to take that safety and the linebacker out of the middle. Z receiver on the outside comes underneath at about five to six yards. And it's just meant to be a really quick control style route. And then the third route I'm gonna run is what Scott Mitchell and I decided to coin. A lot of people call it now the back shoulder fade. The back shoulder fade, we call it the read fade. And in that, that means it's basically no matter what the corner does, whether he's on top or whether the corner is underneath the route, he's wrong. And the quarterback and I automatically know we're on the same page. And then I know exactly the quarterback's going to get the ball out. So let's take a look at a couple of these routes I want to share with you. And I'm going to break me down and do something a little different than what we've done in the past so I can critique myself. And I wasn't, all my routes weren't always rosy. And I've made mis plenty of mistakes just like any receiver has done in the NFL. Uh, but anytime you have an opportunity to, to show some of your good plays, uh, it's always a good thing. So I want to show you three of my plays that I just mentioned. Uh, the first one, as I mentioned before, I'm going to be here and I'm going to start in motion. I know I have Doug Evans. Now, Doug Evans, to give you a little background on him, he was a 6'3 uh, defensive back that they brought in with Green Bay to cover me. And I used to go and get some of their smaller guys, like Terrell Buckley, and, you know, was 5'7", 5'8", and I've gone against Daryl Greens, you know, Nearest Williams, and all these others who, who came later in my career. But with, I started noticing this trend that they started to, to try and guard me and, and have me go against these bigger defensive backs. How do you beat a, beat a bigger defensive back and you're a tall wide receiver? It's with footwork. And for me, I felt I had really good feet. I felt I, I ran my routes. And again, I told you about the guys I looked at, you know, Chris Carter, Jerry Rice, Sterling Sharp, who I thought had the whole package. And I would run my routes and I try and emulate that. But on this one, it's just simply, you're gonna have man here. You got a safety that's gonna also spy here. You got man here with a safety spy and that guy as well. And as I said before, I'm locked in motion here. And then you got the defensive back, uh, you got the linebacker who's looking up Barry in the backfield. So we're all locked up man to man, right? Uh, as I continue to push this forward, as I mentioned before, my route here is to run, to come off of this guy and sell the flat route. Now to sell the flat route, I gotta be able to run out and you, you want that guy to come out with speed and you gotta make that guy think with the, the way you turn your shoulders to the way you turn your head that you're trying to sell the flat route. And in doing that, I know that as soon as he turns his hips to, to defend that flat route, that I'm gonna snap back underneath and I gotta come flat. And you gotta be able to stop on a dime and come back underneath that guy. A guy I learned that was doing that really well was Jerry Rice. He would drop his hips, he would drop his weight, and with his arms still pumping, he'd come back underneath on his routes. And so I studied him and I tried to emulate that and I ended up snapping back underneath to beat that guy on this inside route. So let's look at this quick route. As I come across in motion, I know there, boom. As soon as this corner starts to, to, to defend that flat, my route started here, selling them on that, and then coming underneath. It's an easy read for the quarterback to get me the ball. And as I said before, you got combo up here, you got a combo at the bottom, and now Barry's taking this guy out the middle, and the tight end's taking that guy out. There's a big void that's gonna happen in this area here. It's a route that I really enjoyed running. This was one of my favorites. I used to love the angle route, and as you can see, break back underneath, get inside that, that guy with no help on the inside, big route for us. Another thing we did a lot of, I used to enjoy was motion. You'll see me moving a lot in motion later in my career, especially after my second and third year, because it was harder for me to be the point guy, especially on a, a, a uh, double receiver side, twin receiver side, or in, in a trip set. And in doing that, it, 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 it hindered me from getting off the line sometimes because that guy was so close and he could do what they call his crowd the line of scrimmage. 
and my, re my release became a little bit tighter, a little bit more difficult. By putting me in motion, it meant that they had to move with me, which means their feet were moving, and given my size, if you're a smaller defensive back, you couldn't handle me physically in getting off of that because you, I wasn't in a set position for you to, to hit a shoulder or anything like that. And if you miss, you're really gonna be in trouble. If you're a bigger guy, I could always beat you by having quicker feet. And so I started to actually, I was given the liberty to put myself in motion. So sometimes we'd have a route that's called to the right. I would tell the quarterback, Scott, I'm gonna start in the left and I want you to bring me in motion. Sometimes I would do a jet motion into the formation, or I would just come, I would do a, a, a motion into the center and a return motion. Because I always wanted to make sure, not only did I get a pre-read on my defense, but I also would get an opportunity to look and be able to get that guy out of position and see who else needed to move, because that would identify for me if I was gonna be double covered in man, or if it was a zone, and it, it's just a great way to manipulate the defense. On this one, I, I really like this, right? Simple underneath play. It's gonna be designed to be a dig route. Here, I'm gonna be pressed in man. Tight end's in motion. He's gonna be locked up here. Safety's gonna come down and then see, you can see all of them are locked up here because the safety's coming down for the running back. No matter which direction the running back goes, Barry's gonna go, he's gonna be looking for that guy. Quarterback's gonna look at me to push this guy to sell him on the fade route but then be able to break back underneath him on what we call a five yard dig route. The tight end is supposed to go through the middle and take out this guy and the linebacker, which would leave a void in here. Unfortunately on this play, tight end is gonna stop and it's a broken route. Luckily, the quarterback's gonna get it to me quick enough. He notices that, he stops me with the football slightly. I'm able to catch the ball and then turn it up. This was a, a, a broken play but as a receiver, you're looking at how do you continue to make the big plays. And we, we talk about this as wide receivers. You gotta be playmakers. And that comes from that Michael Irvin mindset. And also looking at a little bit, as I said before, I'm looking, I'm bringing the guys that I kind of looked at and I tried to emulate. And Sterling Sharp would run some of these smaller routes, he would take it to the house. Jerry Routes, Rice, shorter routes, take it to the house. I'm not gonna lie and say I had to break away speed all the time, but I did always have that in the, the top of my mind to see if I could do that. I didn't have the Calvin Johnson speed. I didn't have the Calvin Johnson size, but I had the ability to play all across the board, which made me a highly effective receiver in the NFL. So I'll clear this so you can see me come underneath. And I'm gonna sell him on the outside, beat that corner inside, and you can see the congestion. The, if, the, if the tight end takes this guy out, there's a void in the middle, this guy's on my backside and I'm able to catch the ball and then still be able to turn up. But there's all this congestion in here that shouldn't be there, but luckily they're gonna over pursue. They're gonna still run with the tight end and not realize I'm coming underneath and it gives me a nice path all the way here. But the one thing I want you to pay attention to is up here. So often, the guy away from the ball in the running game, the receivers you always talk about, you never know where the running back's gonna come from, always maintain a block or look to get a block downfield. I credit my teammates like Brett Perriman and Johnny Morton and Dave Sloan at the time, tight end. We would always turn and try and get a block for, because you never know what block's gonna be that important. And on this one, Brett Perriman's gonna end up picking off a safety that has an angle on me that allows me to get into the end zone off of this short play. But it's through his effort that allows this to be an even more successful play than what it turned out to be. So kudos to my teammate. That's why we play the sport and we don't play as individuals, we play as a team. Catching it underneath, everyone's over pursuing, but here comes Brett Perriman, boom, with the big block. Love that guy for that. Made me highly competitive. Couldn't have gotten half the things done that I did without him. Now, final play I told you about was the read fade. Many of you have heard about that back shoulder fade, the fade stop and all that. We used to call it the fade stop, but then Scott and I said, you know, it's not really a fade stop, it's a read fade. Because he knows if I get on top of that corner in my route, that he's gonna throw it behind me. And I'm just gonna push that guy down the field. I'm gonna sell him that I'm going deep down the field, but I know the ball is coming back shoulder, not with a lot of air, and it's gonna be somewhat flat so the corner doesn't have the ability to recover. I also know that if I get on top of that corner on the route, then the ball is gonna be over the top because I got him pinned on my backside. So I got him pinned, so he's shielded off, and I'll just have to get it over the top. So that's how we knew where we were 10, 15, 20 yards down the field, especially in press coverage, I already knew. 
where I need to win. And if I didn't win by a certain time, I knew where the pass was. It gave the confidence in the quarterback. This became a high percentage pass for us. We, we didn't do it quite as much as I would have liked. But when you develop those type of tool sets as a player and you have that ability, you want to come to that over and over. And Scott and I would do that repeatedly. If you look at a lot of my film, if you can get a hold of your VHS tapes, You'd be able to look at some of those film. And we did a lot of back shoulder fades. You start to see that more and more in the NFL. And now it's become kind of a staple in a lot of the, the passing game uh, that people are looking for that, what they call the back shoulder fade. Uh, corner's going to play me heavy on the outside. That's what we call, he, he's, he's shading me to the outside. He's trying to prevent me because he knows that's where he has the least amount of help. So he wants to funnel me back inside to where this safety is because that's where his help is. But... Knowing what that corner is trying to get me to do, I do what's always called attack the technique. So if I see that corner on the outside of me, I'm gonna attack that shoulder. But on this one, he completely opens up, turns his butt to the inside and gives me the outside free release. At that point, that is an easy combination. That's an easy read for myself and the quarterback. Again, that's repetition. That's running the routes over and over, running the play over and over. And as I said before, you got man at the top, you got a corner here that's gonna void. You got a linebacker that's spying to see if anyone comes out, the tight end or anyone comes out of the backfield. You got the safety that's gonna play kind of in this middle side of the field. He's gonna look here if I come inside, but if I don't, he's just gonna play out in the middle of the field. And then he's gotta spy this guy here. He's got, you got the linebacker and the safety that's, sparing, that's gonna spy the running back out of the backfield. On this play, as soon as we see that, oh, Scott Mitchell and I are licking our chops. This was one of the easiest touchdowns I've ever scored in the NFL. And I don't say that out of disrespect. I say that as much out of, we had repped it, we had planned it. We knew exactly 10 steps into this route, we already knew what was gonna happen. If I hadn't beat him off the line of scrimmage or if he was physical and firm at the line of scrimmage and press coverage, and I get on top of him, then all of a sudden I know Scott's gonna lead me. If I get jammed up and I can't beat that guy, I'm still gonna press hard because I know the ball is gonna come back shoulder fade. We executed this to the exact science and this is the result that you get out of it. And I wanted to show you these plays because sometimes we can talk about what we do and we can scout other guys, but unless you go out and you actually do it, then I tell you what, it doesn't mean a whole lot. So I just wanted to be able to show you, uh, so on this, I wanted to be able to show you some of the plays that I've done. I want to break down your boy, I wanna break down my footage so it's not all about critiquing others. As I said before, those are some of the positive plays. I'll see if I can find some negative ones. I know I have those, so I can break those down as well at different times to show you what I've done wrong. But until then, I'll continue to go around the NFL, breaking down wide receiver film here on Lions Nation Unite. But again, if you want this content, you gotta subscribe to our channel and you gotta hit that like button. But until then, I'll see you next time here on Wide Receiver Wednesdays. I'm your boy, Herman Moore. I'm out. Perfect.